Hello everyone, my name is Stuart McPhee. Welcome along to this Trade Zone session presented by 8CAP. Um, of course, I've been with you here all month in the month of July and I'm here again uh, this week, including today's session and again in 48 hours time on Wednesday. For those who are jo joining me live right now, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy day uh, to join with me for the next 30 minutes or so. For those who do know, uh, during my sessions this month, I've uh, always started with a bit of uh, education and today will be no different. And then we're going to have a look at some live charts and talk about some of the analysis that I've been looking at this month. We'll look at some of those major currency pairs, we'll look at gold, a few indices. Some of those things that I have been looking at this month, we've been sort of revisiting um, you know, the next session and the next session. And again, we'll do that again today. Let's move on and start with my PowerPoint. If you've uh, heard me speak uh, this month, you've certainly heard me make this point, and I don't think this point can be overstated. Uh, if you've heard it 500 times, uh, no harm in hearing it 501 times, and that is the importance of having a plan. And, you know, I, I'm pretty comf you know, confident in the fact that you're in this session right now listening to it live or listening to it on delay and listening to it later on. There's a reason for that, and that's because you're interested in trading, funnily enough. You're interested in, you know, having a go at the markets, taking some trades and hopefully making money. Um, that's why this is so important right here. And that is the importance of having a trading plan. And if you have not convinced yourself of the importance of having a trading plan, I would strongly suggest that's the first thing you do before you do anything else. Focus or certainly convince yourself of the importance of having a plan, of having your trading rules compiled into a plan to guide your actions, to, to guide your decision making. I cannot overstate the importance of having a trading plan. So as I've said here, and I've said it previously in other sessions, it is imperative. And you can swap out any other word you want, critical, essential, absolute paramount. Uh, it is imperative that you develop a trading plan that's right for you, suits you, suits your personality, suits your risk tolerance, your risk profile, and then you implement that with the right mindset. Now, in this presentation today, before we go and look at some live charts, I'm actually going to talk about the mindset just a little bit. We'll talk about the six inches in between your ears that ultimately determines whether you're going to do well out of this or not over the long term. But we'll say again, you need to develop a set of trading rules. You put those trading rules together, you put them into a plan, and that plan helps guide in your decision making. But of course, that plan has to be right for you. It has to be really tailor made uh, for you. Um, I've also mentioned the three M's. So the money, the method and the mindset, i.e. the management of money, the management of your exposure to risk. I spoke about that in a previous session and I really did pay it lip service by spending 15 minutes on it because you could comfortably speak for three hours on that and still not really scratch the surface of the numbers behind managing risk, setting stops, position sizing, taking profits, using trading exits, you know, reward to risk relationships, expectancy, all sorts of different things you can talk about under that umbrella of managing your money or managing your risk. Methodology is, you know, sort of the trading system, the strategy, the, the way in which or the process you use to identify new trading opportunities the trading, I guess, the decision-making process to determine whether something is a trading opportunity or not. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's your trading system, trading strategy. And then there's the glue that keeps it all together. And as I mentioned, the six inches in between the ears, and it's that particular section right at the bottom there that I'll just spend the next five, 10 minutes uh, talking about just for a little while. So a trader's mindset. <clears throat> uh, look, I think if I think back to when I first started, I can, I've spoken to a lot of traders over the years in, and I mean thousands, um, over, you know, in different countries. And I think when you speak to someone who has little trading experience and they're just getting going and you were to say to them, oh, by the way, you know, John, by the way, Jeff, by the way, Rachel, the most important part of your trading life is going to be your psychology. It's going to be your mindset. And they're going to go, that's rubbish. Like that's, 
Why are you wasting my time telling me that? That's a joke, right? Cannot be that. It has to be charts. It has to be analysis. It has to be which trade you choose. It has to be how much money you make, how much money, all these other things. And I'm going to say, no, no, no. <laughs> the most important thing is your mindset. Someone who hasn't traded at all is going to dismiss that. It's at some point along your trading journey and hopefully sooner rather than later that you realize, you know what? I think that person was right. Your psychology, your mindset is unbelievably important. Well, it's really the most important part of this entire journey. And that is, again, your psychology, your mindset. And we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, just coming up now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Trading, don't give me, you know, don't. Don't mistake this at all, but trading is a psychological endeavour. Summed up perfectly, it is a psychological endeavour. It has little to do with, you know, you've got to analyse charts, you have to decide to enter trades, you have to manage risk, you have to do all those things. But at the end of the day, it comes down to a psychological endeavour. It comes down to your ability to cope in certain situations, how you respond to situations in the market. That's what it boils down to. And your mindset, your psychology determines how well those other things are taken care of, how well you manage risk, how well you follow that plan with discipline and patience and decisiveness and the like. And I love this expression. It is so straightforward. And that is trading is simple, but it's not easy. And there's a difference between simplicity and ease. The principles that work in trading are time tested and there's no secrets to them. The whole idea of, as an example, you know, buying into trends or, or entering trades into trends, buying an up, selling down. That's not the only way to trade, don't get me wrong, but let's just say trend following, going with the trend, um, you know, managing risk well, setting stops, sticking to those stops. Um, let me just go back to a simple example of just trading a stock as an example. If we're going to buy a stock at $1 and I'm going to say to you, look, can you set a stop loss at 90 cents for me? And you're going to say, what does that mean? I'm going to say, so you're going to enter this stock at a dollar, but when you enter, you don't know what's about to happen. So what we need to do is to protect ourselves. And the way we'll protect ourselves is putting an order in the system through your broker that if the price of that stock falls down to 90 cents, that order is automatically executed and you close out that trade sell back the same number you bought, you close out the trade and realise the loss. Now, you can explain that concept to almost anybody, including non-traders, and they would understand that concept. It's a really simple concept. Um, I can explain it to a very young child and they would understand it. So the principles are relatively straightforward. The principles are time-tested. They're relatively straightforward and they can be quite simple. However, that doesn't mean our ability to implement and adhere and execute those rules and certainly adhere to those rules doesn't mean that's easy. Um, again, that all comes back to the importance of psychology and how important it is to ensure you are following what your trading plan should be doing. If you were to ask me to list sort of important character attributes, uh, I'd list quite a few. This would be my number one. And that is discipline, the level of self-control you have, uh, your ability to do something, even though deep down you don't want to do it. Um, and you can throw up other character attributes. You can talk about decisiveness and confidence and, and other things. But I don't think you can have some of those other things unless you have some measure of self-control. And as I mentioned, I think discipline, simple thing is doing things you know should be done, even though you really don't feel like doing it. That to me is discipline. That's the bridge. That's the thing that gets you doing what you should be doing. And how often in trading, I can assure you that you are faced with many situations where you know what you should be doing, but you really don't want to do it. You'd rather choose option B. Option B is far simpler. It's far easier for you to accept. You're more comfortable doing that. But really option A is what the time-tested rules and what your trading plan says you should be doing. That to me is the discipline, bridging the gap between B and A, ignoring B and going ahead with A, knowing that that's in fact the right thing to do to be the best trader we can be. Um, that's sort of what I'm alluding to there with the easy and the hard and often we'll face with two decisions. One of them is really quite easy and that gives us the most comfort. Uh, well, that's easy. I'll just bury my head in the sand and forget about that trade. 
for the next 24 hours and really just hope that it improves tomorrow over the next 24 hours and I can revisit it tomorrow and things would have got a little bit better. The harder decision is going, no, no, that's hit my stop. I need to execute this trade. I don't want to do it, but I know I should be doing it. That's the hard decision. And that's where the discipline steps up and says, well, I really don't care what you feel like doing. We need to do the right thing. And of course, the most important thing with the discipline is following the rules. Um, I love this quote. It's taken out of a book called Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. It is an absolute must read if you're interested in trading called Market Wizards. Market Wizards is simply a compilation of interviews among very, very uh, successful, highly profitable traders, except for one of the interviews who is a trading psychologist and it's this person right here. And this person says, you can see the name down in the bottom there, Vanta. He says, most successful market professionals achieve success by controlling risk. Controlling risk goes against our natural tendencies. Risk control requires tremendous internal control. I'm going to say it again, coming back to what I just mentioned about discipline. Most successful market professionals achieve success by controlling risk. However, however, there's a problem. The problem is controlling risk goes against our natural tendencies and what we want to do. Therefore, risk control requires tremendous internal control in brackets discipline. This is a guy that's uh, consulted and coached traders for now more than 40, that's four zero, 40 years. I think he has a fair understanding of what it takes to be a successful trader of any ability. And that person sums it up really quite well. I want to talk about one other attribute before we go and look at some charts. Confidence. Now, again, we can go to the dictionary and go, what does confidence mean? And we all have an understanding of what confidence means, but why is it important when it comes to trading? Well, confidence is that self-belief, belief in yourself and in your own ability and anything you're going to do. Um, and clearly, if we're going to set up a trading plan and we're the ones that set it up, we need to have some confidence in it. And we need to have some confidence in our ability to follow that plan. Where do you get confidence from, though? It's all very well and good for you to be sitting there and going, yeah, that, that makes sense. Of course, you need confidence. But then I, you know, when I've coached people and I've done it a lot over the years, you know, people say, well, where do I get this confidence from? I know it's important, but I really don't have it. Okay, well, where do you get it? I don't think you can purchase it. You don't go into a bookstore or go to Amazon and type in trading confidence or any sort of confidence. You might find a book in there or two in there, but you don't actually buy a box with you know, self-belief with confidence. So where do you get it from? I think you get it from two sources. One is competence. And that's what I say there about competence yields confidence. If you're good at something, you're typically quite confident at doing it, whether it be playing golf, playing the piano, running a business, whatever it might be. If you are competent, you will be confident. Competence yields confidence. So don't focus so much on searching for a box of confidence. Develop the competence, develop the knowledge and the competence and the experience in the markets. The other way I think you can get confidence and it can really come quite quickly is through simply results, trading results, performance. And if you get on a run and, you know, you start to really have some really solid trades, following rules, having some wins, having some losses, having some more wins and overall making money, you think you'll be confident in what you're doing? Of course you will. You hear this in sports all the time. Um, team just wins their seventh game in a row, you know, they shove the microphone in the player's face post-game. Oh, we're playing with a lot of confidence. Well, why is that? Well, it's because you're winning, right? Of course you're playing with a lot of confidence. You know, the results will yield that uh, confidence as well. Um, when it comes to confidence, that means you won't be interested in any tips that anyone gives you. Um, it's a great position to be in. I think it's worth aspiring to. So I'm going to tell you this right now. One of the things that I think you should aspire to is to be in a position where you could not care less about what anybody else thinks about the market and where the price of gold is going, where the euro is going, anything. You could not care less. Why can you not care less? Well, that's because you have confidence in what you are doing, knowing full well that nobody knows what's going to happen in the market in the next one hour or the next 24 hours or the next week. Nobody knows. Um, so what you do is you have confidence in what you are doing and the plan you have and implementing that plan and following the rules 
and seeing the results. That's where the confidence comes in to follow that plan. Therefore, you could not care less what anybody else thinks. You just follow what you are doing. One of the ways in which we can get uh, some confidence in what we're doing with our plan, and I'll finish very quickly, is through some back testing. Uh, and that is, you know, getting a strategy and testing it, proving it or disproving it, validating it, saying, yes, this, in fact, does have a chance of working if I stick to those rules. So, you know, confidence is really, really important. Discipline is important. I was going to go through that. Um, I'm running out of time because I do want to go look at some charts. I think I owe that to you. Um, and there's quite a few things here. I can also talk about some general issues under psychology and endowment theory. If you want to just go and look that up, I can explain it, but I won't with uh, the time I have um, developing your own methodology. Simplicity, I've spoken about that before. Maybe, you know, the session on Wednesday, I might actually just start with this particular slide um, and go through some of those points. Let's go and have a look at some charts um, and we're going to have a look at some, some of the things that we've been looking at uh, for the last uh, week or so. We'll start with the Australian dollar. Um, you know, I do follow this a... Uh, a fair bit. I mentioned uh, some key levels uh, that have been around for several months now, certainly 66 and 68, which are these levels. I'll get my cross here so you can see where my mouse is. So 66 right here, 68 here. And just in the last month or so, we have seen it obviously break through that 68 level. Certainly tried one day here, another day really, really tried, finally broke through, got to another multiple of one cent in 69 cents formed a classic reversal sort of pattern here. Not, not the strongest reversal pattern you'll see, but certainly a reversal pattern in the form, in the form of a doji. We often see these dojis at turning points. Here's one down the bottom here, and we could go back and find more, uh, more dojis, as I've probably shown you in previous sessions. Uh, again, not a, not a textbook doji, but again, I don't think, you know, you're wasting it, not wasting your time. Your time is probably better spent looking for perfect candlestick patterns and looking for perfect patterns. I think it's better to understand what's going on with patterns rather than looking for perfect textbook examples. You can certainly see here a bit of indecision. You know, the range is half of the previous uh, day. We sort of finish off roughly where we started. We made 69, but more so it's the next day when it actually started to roll through, broke through the low of the previous trading period and actually closed there and then kept going. That's enough to say the reversal's on. And then we look at 68 cents, which, of course, had been a level of resistance for some time and quite likely to then provide support to the pair. And it didn't. Uh, it may have, if we went down to an hourly chart or a four hourly chart, we may have seen it uh, back here, maybe bounce off. Whoops. No, I need to undo that. Maybe bounce off a little bit when it came back, but it actually didn't. So it's come back to 68 and really spent very little time bouncing off and then straight back down below again. Um, and then we actually found the resistance at 68 stood up again. So it got broken here, didn't stay over there long, four days, broke down here really quite strongly, retested, and all of a sudden 68 was reinforced again as a level of significance. Tried again the next day, failed again, and then really strongly fell off. Um, and what we've seen more recently is tested again, get through really, really strongly, get to 69 cents again, and then roll over again. So again, we're seeing you can almost forget 66 cents just for the time being, and we're focusing more on 68 and 69. Um, so when it got back down to 68 again, this time was a little bit different because we did actually see some support at that previous resistance level. We did actually see the support kick in. And we can see here for the course of like, What's that? One, two, three, four, miss sort of five, six, seven, maybe again eight, nine, and then even further. So for quite almost two days there, we've actually sat on that 68 cents level, finding support at that previous resistance level. Um, that's significant, but it actually didn't, like the previous time, had a bit of a bounce, but then actually quite quickly just fell back down through that, tested again, and then dropped off really quite sharply. And in this case now, it has actually tried to find some support there over you know, two or more days, even then it still failed because we really didn't get that bounce back up. Um, moving, perhaps zooming a little bit closer. So we did actually get that support there, um, but then it did break through, test it again, and then we, you know, 68 again continues to stand up. Um, you cannot dismiss the importance of that level. It is playing a role. Um, could it fall down to 66 cents right now? Absolutely it could and retest that level again. 
if it was to get down there, could it find support there? Absolutely it could. Is it likely to? Yeah, probably. Um, so we need to do now do some numbers and go, look, if I was to trade short here thinking, you know, do we wait for a little retracement back up towards 68 and look to sell it again and then look to see if it's going to push back down to 66 cents? Then we just need to work out a reward to risk. You know, if we wait to retrace the 67.50, put a stop down there, sorry, take profit at 66, that's 150-odd pips. Where's our stop going to be? You definitely want to put it on the other side of 68 cents. So we're now looking at a stop of maybe 60, 65, 70, 75 pips away above that 68 cent level, um, you know, above this level here. So over here somewhere, entering up here, take profit down here. Um, and what are we trying to do? What, what I'm doing here is massaging the numbers. I'm trying to come up with a scenario in which we have a high probability, but the reward to risk is in our favour. And the reward I'm looking at here is a 150 pip gain compared to a 60 to sort of 75 pip uh, loss. In other words, I'm looking for two to one at least. Uh, we don't want one to two. We don't even really like one to one. We certainly prefer two to one, one and a half to one sort of as a minimum, but more two to one. If you wanted to take it right now, <coughs> excuse me, um, yeah, you could do that, but again, you've got to ascertain what's our potential take profit. Will it fall all the way to 66? Yep, if it's going to head down, it's going to probably get to 66 and bounce back up again. We put our take profit there. Now we're only looking at 130 uh, pip gain, maximum sort of reward, and where's our stop going to be? To achieve, you know, to achieve that sort of two to one, we're now looking at a 65 pip stop, and now we're at 67.95. In other words, now we're sitting on the sort of wrong side of that 68 cent level because we're not providing ourselves that extra layer of protection by jumping. Imagine the 68 cent level is a fence and you have, I'm just trying to picture some animal, picture some really vicious dogs running after you and you're running towards this fence and these dogs are chasing you. Now, would you rather stop five metres short of the fence, turn around and face these dogs coming towards you or would you rather continue towards the fence jump over the fence that the dogs can't go to get over, jump over it and move another five, 10 minutes away on the other side of the fence, right? The answer is obvious. You provide yourself that extra layer or level of protection if you can. But if we were to take a short position right now, the numbers really can't quite adding up unless we're prepared to take something less than two to one reward to risk. And that's something you as a trader need to work out if that suits your risk tolerance and that's something that you would uh, consider doing. The And that's it on the Australian dollar just for the moment. The British pound, we've spoken about this a, a little bit as well, just such a solid, steady uptrend, just moving so steadily well. And we've got to some key levels here. What are we at here? 128, 130, and more recent times we've moved up to about, what was it, about an 18-month high, something like that. That's pretty significant when things move to an 18-month high. There's a reason for that. And that's because there's a lot of demand for it. And we could try to work out why there's that level of demand and lack of supply, or as a technical analyst, uh, I don't mean to say this too bluntly, but I really don't care. What I do know is there is a lot of demand and not a lot of uh, supply in that sort of uh, nice steady move up. However, we have got to um, this position now where it's got to 130, had a little test there at 130, nice round number, multiple of 10 cents. If we narrow it in just a little bit closer, we can see that it didn't spend a huge amount of time there, probably half a day, actually hitting that 130 level and not able to break through. So what's that, about three, four hours there, three lots of four hours, being a four-hourly chart. Uh, so half a day and then on that fourth one, had a little run through, probably not convincing, and then it got convincing. So that's pretty significant. But it did, you know, we don't always get a lot of green candles in a row, push through to that high, 18-month high, and then just after that, it's just sort of been drifting back lower. Could it have been expected to find uh, some support at 130? Eh, not so much. Why? Because it really hasn't been. If you think about the, let's just come back here to the Australian dollar. We know the 68 cent level has very much established itself as a point of resistance. It's tested it multiple times and failed multiple times over the course of several months. So it's it's played a role multiple times, not just once, multiple. 
And if you compare that now to the British pound, the 130 level, I mean, I said it might be a level of significance and I stand by that because it's a multiple of 10 cents and it's very easy for people to think in terms of multiples of 10 cents. But did it really provide a lot of resistance? No, this was fleeting. It didn't certainly, you know, it didn't hit 130 and just come crashing back down again. It didn't test it for several days in a row and then break through or then fall away. It just got there. The 130 level played a role. It did what I said it would. You know, people are going to think in terms of those round numbers, multiples of 10 cents. It definitely stalled for 12 hours or so, but then it kept breaking through. So is it a level of significance? Yes, but not massively significant. It's not the same as a 68 cent level with the Australian dollar, which of course has on multiple occasions. So when it came back down again, was it going to then just, you know, bounce back off a dollar thirty and find a lot of support there? No, not really, because it really wasn't a strong level of resistance. That's why it's of no surprise that it actually just came back and continued to fall lower. This 128 level, on the other hand, had been a level of resistance for longer and played more of a role than I would argue the 130 level. So when it's come back down here, no surprise that it has actually bounced off that 128 level and likely could retest 130 again. What have we seen here? A falling away, here's the prevailing trend. It's down, falling from the new highs above 130. And what do we see down at the bottom here? A weakness in the prevailing trend in the form of a doji candlestick. Again, not perfect. Don't look for textbook examples. But that's a good example of the body of the candlestick being in the centre of the range. And we've sort of started here. We did up, we did down. We have ended up back where we started. That's representing indecision. It shows a weakness in the prevailing trend. The prevailing trend was going down five days in a row. It's now showing a weakness in that trend combined with the fact that it's hitting a level which has previously been a level of significance. So it's sort of adding more weight to what we think might happen. Um, would people consider trading this long right now? Absolutely, they would. The longer term trend is up. Um, we've got a good little reversal pattern here, doji. Um, we've seen a bounce off the 130, uh, sorry, the 128 level, which previously has been a level of resistance, of significance. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just adding more weight to possibly what we might uh, see. Um, I've looked at gold a little bit. Euro, we've looked at, uh, we spoke about this last week. You know, I talk about classic uh, doji candlesticks representing indecision. There's a classic, look at this, almost three in a row, probably not so much a doji, that third one there with the range of the body, a little bit closer towards the bottom end of that range. But we've seen a very, very strong, here's a classic reversal here, actually, a weakness in prevailing trend, a little doji there, but it didn't follow through. We didn't get that confirmation of, yes, a short-term uptrend, weakness in the trend, hitting a key level, likely to reverse, but it just didn't. We've broken through, but now we've got strong uptrend, weakness, right, indecision in the prevailing trend, three days in a row. We're really, really not sure where's all the people have been buying this up, where's the more people to come in, they're nowhere to be seen, and sure enough, we've seen it now roll back um, just off those sort of highs and potentially back down to that 110 level. It doesn't look like it's going to get there anytime soon, but we appreciate the fact that 110 has played a role repeatedly, look at this, this is three weeks here, repeatedly playing a role, plays a role again. So if it was to come back down to 110, quite likely it will find support at that 110 level and then potentially retest this sort of 18 month high back up here again. But all we're doing here is just basic technical analysis, looking at the, the bigger picture, the overall trends, we're looking at key levels and we're looking for you know, signals or signals or candlestick patterns to get us into trades based on those key levels and based on those trends. And that's really the cornerstone, the foundation of how I do my analysis and how I trade. Um, so that's just looking at a few currency pairs and looking at stuff, what's going on right now. Well, all of a sudden, as always, my time has come to a, a, a time has come to an end very, very quickly. Um, look, I hope that's provided some food for thought and, again, just giving you a bit more insight on how I do things and hopefully the psychology stuff helped a little bit. I'll do a little bit more of that in my next session in 48 hours' time on Wednesday. Until then, please manage your risk, trade well, and I look forward to speaking to you again next time. Thanks, thanks again.